Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Oh, hi, Nikki. Happy ADHD oh, Awareness Month. Are you still aware? I'm still aware. Oh, delightful. <laughs> oh, me too. I'm very excited. As we record this, uh, we've got our first open community coffee with Pete coming up this Friday. I'm very excited about it. By the time this show goes live, you'll you'll have missed it already. But it's really exciting. So listen to all the emails that are coming because we're doing lots of good stuff this October. Uh, and we're very excited to do more of it uh, in public, out loud. Out loud. Uh, but out from behind the gate, the velvet curtain. Oh, so many metaphors. Um, <laughs> so do we? Do you have any news? For the uh, for the no, the, uh, no how are news. you feeling? I'm feeling great. Yeah, yeah. All right. You you're questioning me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I, you're yeah. You're I guess I am. To say something else. <laughs> I don't know what to expect. Anyhow, speaking of ADHD Awareness Month, by the time you're listening to this episode, October is coming to a close. Uh, but we do just want to take a second to thank a few people first. To all of our past guests and friends of TCA, a big thank you for your giveaway donations. We've been we've been donating throughout the entire month. And that's been super exciting. We also have to thank everybody on Team TCA, uh, without whom none of this would be possible. And finally, of course, to everyone in this community, a giant thank you to all of you. Thanks to everyone for taking part in this month's activities. We hope you've enjoyed connecting with us and, of course, each other in the Taking Control Discord server. If you'd like to continue to participate in these weekly and monthly events like our accountability anchor sessions and Coffee with Pete and Coaching with Nikki, please consider becoming a Patreon member at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. We sure appreciate you for even thinking about it. This week's episode is brought to you by Text Expander, one of the best invisible tools in my tech tool chest. Here's how it works. If there's a piece of text that I type more than once, that's a signal that I need to add it to Text Expander. I keep my most used emails, phrases, text messages, URLs, and more right in my Text Expander library. Now, a snippet can include text, links, images, code, account numbers, phone numbers, addresses, whatever you want. The trick is, for each one of those snippets in my library, I assign a unique abbreviation. Then I expand it. I can deploy the content I need with just a few keystrokes on any device across any apps I use. Just type the abbreviation for the snippet I'm looking for, and boom, text expanded. You can even get your whole team or family access to all the content they need to use every day, organize it by department and group, and make sure that all of your snippets are used consistently wherever they're needed. This month's Text Expander news, you guys, this is huge. If you use Google Chrome as your web browser, you've always had the Text Expander extension. But this month, the team at Text Expander has been working with you all in mind. Because now, the Text Expander Chrome extension is the full Text Expander experience. That's right, they have completely overhauled the extension. And now, if you live in Chrome, use a Chromebook, can't install apps on your computer, but do have control over your browser, you can access all of your snippets and manage them right there, right in the browser. And because it's the same app you're used to, you can continue to share your most used snippets with your family or your team right in Chrome. So if you haven't updated the extension yet and you already have it installed, or if you just want to get it in your Chrome, head over to the Chrome Web Store and get it installed today. It's fantastic. With Text Expander, it's all so easy. Also available on Mac and Windows and iPhone and iPad. And for listeners of the ADHD podcast, you can get 20% off your first year of service. Just visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Text Expander, and you will be whisked over to our page on their site where you can get started. Again, if you get started now, you'll save 20% off your subscription for that first year. The way we work is changing rapidly. Make work work the way your brain works by saying more in less time and with less effort using Text Expander. Our great thanks to the Text Expander team for sponsoring the ADHD podcast. And now let's get on with the show. Welcome back, Taking Control Hall of Famer, James Ochoa for appearance number nine. 
Nuevo. Woo-hoo-hoo. Now, for 30 years, <laughs> over 30 years, James Ochoa has combined counseling, coaching, mentoring, and intuition to help adults with ADHD live meaningful lives. He's the originator of one of our favorite concepts, helping us to calm the storms of adult ADHD. And he's here to talk to us about the power of community in our ADHD journey. And of course, to give us an update on his next book, When the Shiny Wears Off, Navigating the Lifetime Storms of Adult ADHD. That's right. We remember. It's coming. That focuses on how to handle chronic stress of ADHD. James, welcome back, old friend. Uh, I tell you, it's a great welcome and a, just a thrill to be here and nine times. That's uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I could start the show with something strange and weird because I don't know if people know that I actually have nine fingers. Actually, lost a finger. <gasps> That's right. Many, many years ago. Okay, oh. I, so. because you brought it up, <laughs> how did you lose the finger? James? Yes, uh, obviously, I'm very comfortable with it now. I was wearing a ring, a college graduation ring, and it was a construction accident. So, not much fun. Oh, not much fun. No, not, that sounds not, cool. 22 years old. Yeah. It was 40 years ago. It's amazing to me that. Uh, wow. It was, uh, it's uh, yeah. it's interesting. I did. I lost 11 pounds of grip strength in my right hand. Uh, these these two wow. are your grip strength. These are the ones you don't want to lose. Uh, and it was a great turning point in my life. That's actually one of my major turning points toward counseling. It was like, okay, I think it's time to go be a counselor. I'm not very good on the construction yeah. site. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did not Red expect flag. that this to be working the, for me. <laughs> yes, that is a hard life turn. I expected it to be like I have to overcome this internal trauma uh, about oh, no. losing oh, the no. finger and what it has done to my life. And instead, it's no, uh, I'm not very no, good with a I'm hammer. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm heading out of here. This is, this is not. Yeah, my, that was smart. Yeah, it was like oh, it's not good to lose yeah. body parts. So anyway, it's funny because I'm no. thinking no, nine. Whenever I think good. of nine, people are, and it's always funny as an ADHD therapist right when you work with people with adhd and i'm in my office moving my hands i can tell when people notice because they do the head they, their head goes back a couple yeah. times it's like oh you notice i'm missing a finger it's it's nothing yeah. to yeah. me now it's just a funny thing i cannot hold change i cannot clap in this hand because you need oh, yeah. a it's flat yeah you need something yeah. Totally yeah. bizarre so those well, are the two pieces of disability oh. i think i came away with was not being able to hold change and clap i'll be okay i'm good that's so there's a absolutely. personal story to start our day off. I like well, it. We like your nine <laughs> fingers, all 10 worth, James. Uh, yes. <laughs> all right. Yes. Nikki, set us up, please. All, all month long, we've been um, focusing on the importance of joining and belonging a community. We've explored how to find a community to connect with. Uh, defining or redefining yourself within a community, uh, talked a lot about uh, reasons why people might shy away. Uh, we talked with Dr. Celine, or Celine, Dr. Sharon Celine, uh, around um, some of those topics uh, of why people might be a little bit anxious, like around the social anxiety piece of, of joining a a community. So I know I experienced uh, a community with mm-hmm. you, James, in the spring. I think it yeah. was spring. It was. Pretty it sure was. It was. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, where you have a group of people mm-hmm. that come together. Yeah. Uh, so what are your thoughts about being connected with a group of well, people? Well, uh, it, it's a, it's a enormously important topic. And I'm so glad y'all have taken the month to extrapolate it and pull it apart because um, I believe that, you know, I see, and I, I personally want to move in the, uh, in what I would consider as an evolution in the space of ADHD that uh, that's beyond strategies, that's beyond medication, that's beyond organization. All those things are critically important. They're foundational features. Uh, but to get into the long-term nature of what ADHD as a ADHD is as a diagnosis, but as a neurology and a development and a long-term space, community is a part of that. Okay, community is that long-term space of how I connect with others and how they connect with me. And so I'm just that's exactly where my entire perspective is headed. I'm 62. I think I'll be in this game at least another 20, could be 30 years. I mean, God willing, I'm having fun still. So who knows what ADD will look mm-hmm. like in 20 years here. Uh, We won't even want to Mm -hmm. talk about that. Uh, But the reality is that community is critically important as a a nature of connection between us. And it's a core space of who we are that builds what we're going to term as internal safety. 
And internal safety is something we're all born with as infants uh, and that we have naturally growing up. You know, we don't turn on our survival instinct and startle responses unless there's a reason to. Okay. And so we're curious, we're observing the world, we're feeling the world. That's what we're doing. Okay. And so to me, community starts two places. One, it starts externally and how we were cared for, but two, it starts internally on, you know, how I oriented to my sensations, feelings, states, thoughts, all these things. Well, if you layer ADD into this space and you started to feel different early on in your life and not knowing why, those differences start to tumble and your community starts to potentially fracture or not get developed as well as it could. Uh, and that's why it's so critically important, particularly in childhood, right, to normalize the space of what ADHD is or isn't along the lines of hair color, height, and weight. This is just who you are. There's nothing wrong or broken. Mm -hmm. And these are the assistance mm -hmm. you need. This, And so I work with that with parents for years, and now I'm working with adults uh, on an ongoing basis. But so community to me starts with the sense of safety. It starts with that sense of, am I belonging, right? And I could talk for days on the emotional and mental stress that spins off of not having community or that being fractured or that being really splintered in some ways. So I think it's external community, how we connect with others, relationships, uh, interests, those kind of things. But it's as important to talk about your own internal community with yourself. You know, I'm a big imagination guy. So I'm like, okay, yes, who, you are. who are your mental support group people? Who do you uh, see in your mind's eye or uh, who are the mentors that you really keep up with that keeps you resourced? So community, resourcing, mindfulness, these are all my big, big hunts right now uh, of people who, uh, for people with ADHD, who really have to learn to normalize the idea that they need to resource, they need to have community on an ongoing basis. And it's tragic if we don't. I want us to, to circle back to the mental support group, because when we were talking about what we wanted to talk to you about, that was what came out of me is like, oh, he can talk about this because this is something that he writes in mm -hmm. his book. And it really, you know, connects yep. with what we're talking about with the external yes. community. So right. tell our audience a little bit more about what this mental support group is? So uh, first of all, when we look at the ideas of using your imagination, so this is all, everything's in your mind's eye. And I want to preface this with that I'm very well aware that there are many uh, that I've become aware of that have a mind, have a blind eye to their imagination. They cannot see things in their imagination. Aphantasia mm -hmm. uh, is a space of not having that eye. And so for those who have aphantasia, who can't see things in their imagination or conceptualize them, they have to use feeling states, they have to use pictures, they have to use other sensations, but they can uh, get to that space. So you're using your imagination. And in this case, we're talking about a mental support group or people, ideas of who you think would support you. And these this could be family, it could be relatives, it could be mentors that you've never met before. I talk about in my book, Someone in my mental support group is Deepak Chopra. I've never met Deepak Chopra. Maybe one day he'll hear your podcast, Nikki, and he'll go, oh, interesting. <laughs> right, never maybe. Met I want to be on that. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe he'll invite me, and maybe we'll be here together. But so Deepak Chopra is someone who I really relate to based on mindfulness, based on neuroscience, based on who he is as a science uh, or a doctor uh, and the ideas of science and research, but just how he carries himself. So what do I do in my mental support group with Deepak Chopra? I could talk to him from a comforting point of view about mindfulness or stresses that I'm having. And I can hear his, you know, uh, uh, Indian accent and how he's calming, calmly telling me to, you know, things are going to be OK or those are great ideas. Stick with them. I've had challenges in my life because he's very authentic, too. So what am I doing? I'm using, in this case, Deepak Chopra to mirror image back to me the things that I need, and I'm ultimately what? Relating with myself. This is a mirror through someone else back to myself. Well, I go back to that sense of internal safety. That's what gets built here. Mm -hmm. So I probably have 17 or 18 in my mental support group now, go figure, Mr. Hyperactive guy here. I have lots of people in my mental support group 
Uh, and I've had great spiritual experiences from a sense of meaningfulness of how they help support me in my life. Um, mm. And it doesn't have to be just people, right? I've had people mm. use, I had some woman who used a, um, uh, the, what is it, 3,000 year old redwood tree in California that's got, I don't know, 700 species of animals in it. Uh, and that was her, that was her mental support group person. Okay. So she related yeah. to nature and trees. It's her imagination. This isn't schizophrenic. It's not crazy. It's not weird. It's just real. It's a way mm -hmm. to relate to yourself. I really want to take this idea of imagination and thinking of things in our mind as strange or weird or something's wrong with it. It's most, one of the most powerful tools we have in our brain. Without well, it's, a doubt. It's, it's interesting that you, that, that you bring it up. I, only because, you know, when we're talking about community, one of the things that I've been thinking about uh, of, of late is this idea of like social optimism versus social pessimism, right? Because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we deal with with ADHD is like, you know, for those of us who sort of grew up in our sort of formative social years, mm -hmm. challenged with ADHD, that judgment lingers large, yes. right? It's a oh, long yes. shadow we're trying to get out right. from under. And that right. can lead to a bit of social pessimism and yes. anxiety around yes. making friends and having viable relationships yes. with a community that is marred by fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And yes. I can imagine even the the your your mental support group, yep. it'd be pretty easy for you to start using some real negative self talk around the the voices that you're listening to. Well, okay, so that and that's a really important point, Pete. Because when we're talking about imagination, one of the things that you set up in the ideas of, it's also talk about an emotional safe place, a place that you can go in your mind's eye that's completely safe for you is you're setting up boundaries of safety mentally in your own mind's eye. So if things turn in a space that's negative or feels negative to you, that's more of a, oh, I'm going to go get a mental support person who negates that, who can counteract this, okay? Because I see those as, there's a term I have called mental energy leaks, which is kind of the where our mental energy are, collides into other things that we don't want it to negative voices being one of those mental energy leaks uh, that we have to work at managing. Because what is a, uh, a, a what is that space of pessimism or negativity? It's a limbic system in the center of the brain overactive. It's a threat response. It's a stress-related response. So if I know that immediately, then how do I go about calming it? Okay. Uh, I don't think I've said this. You always get these first for me nationally because I don't think I've talked about <laughs> this. I did back in 2008. You talk about stress and, and, and the limbic system being too activated. I did a, um, a strategic therapeutic daydreaming, right? That's what I use as a well, as a term that says I'm going to go into my mind's eye, my imagination, into my support group, into my emotional safe place on purpose and just go hang out in you know, experience. Well, I was having lots of stress in 2008, trying to figure out the conundrums of ADD still. I went back into what I considered as my survival instinct. Okay. And I took a little daydream and I visited fight, flight, and freeze. All mm -hmm. right. These are our, this is our survival instinct. And so in my cartoon imagination, like I went up to fight, flight, and freeze. And there are these little guys in chairs, pulling levers, overstressed, just sweating, and I'm like, guys, what's going on here? And they're like, you are running us off a cliff all the time. You're so hyperactive. You're so impulsive. So what I did in that space was relating to myself. So in talking to them, I'm like, okay, guys, what do you need? What do you need help with? What do you need support with? This will appreciate, you'll appreciate this, Pete. They're all like, we want shiny suits. We want something to look really <laughs> special. We want the best gaming chairs there are. Okay. What am I doing here and going to talk to myself and my survival instinct? It's a mental gymnastic. I'm doing a flip in my own mind to calm down my limbic system. So hopefully negative voices, things of that nature become less significant or disruptive because I build a relationship with myself. Now, I've opened up some interesting chasms today and things like this, but I do those kind of things because that imagination resources me. It helps me to center myself. So, and there's lots of well, ways to counteract that negativity. 
Sure. And and just the act of visualizing those sorts of relationships pays incredible dividends mm-hmm. when it comes to facing your own terrestrial social anxiety and yes. building your building your resources in flesh and blood. Exactly. So going into a social situation, <clears throat> I could take someone from my mental support group who is supporting me, uh, who is riding on my shoulder, so to speak, or is like, you know, uh, you're okay with this. And it's okay to, it's those conversations with ourselves that, I don't know, we, we still pathologize too much or we say there's something wrong with them versus something right with them, that that's one of the healthiest things you can do is have an ongoing dynamic conversation with yourself in a meaningful way. God, we just do not do that very well in this, uh, in my opinion, from a mental health point of view. I don't want to linger on social pessimism, but it's something that I think comes up um, and and I'm eager to get your thoughts on it. This idea that I've got people in my own family who who feel this way, who have have aligned their perception of their introversion, extroversion, their place on that scale mm-hmm. with their need or lack of need of community or friendships. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, I, I have enough friends. I only, I can only maintain a single best friend or two good friends. Like mm-hmm. I can't, I can't handle any more than that. What's your take on, on folks in, in that position? I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to be sort of judgment free because I, I know I have some close relationships. I try to have more, <laughs> but well, but when we're talking about introversion, extroversion, we're talking about the need for social connection or community with others or connection with yeah. others. I do think there is a personal uh, profile everyone has on the ability, the desire to want to connect to others. Am I energized? Am I not? Uh, do I feel better in, in, in kind of resourcing myself as an introvert or being away from that? But I think this is where COVID completely changed things from a social muscle point of view, because it put us all in prison, in my opinion. We had the mentality that we were limited in our freedom at some level. And that feels like a prison to anyone who's in that space. It doesn't matter your circumstances. So mentally, we all went through this stress, but we had a, we, we now have an orientation that says, we have a social muscle. It's like, okay, do I want to be out there? Or do I not want to be out there? So I believe, though, the core space is we are, we are interrelated beings. We connect to each other, and that's how we survive, okay? But what that is, we are not a soul-surviving species. We are a group-surviving species that connects with one another. So your introversion, extroversion, I think that it's a personal profile that you look at how much do I need? What do I get from it? But so much of that is built out of old history, anxieties, uh, really negative talk or things that didn't go well. So I'm a big proponent of setting yourself up for success through common interests, meetup groups, go and do things on the periphery socially, but be around people in a way that works for you. Okay, that is meaningful. That gives you some sense of self. Uh, uh, And I do find people who prefer to be quiet or by themselves. But if you ask them and they're in a mentally healthy state, they have community in their own mind's eye or they have community with a church group or a social group when they want to. There's nothing off with that. Does that make sense or is that some... No, I think it makes a lot of sense to me because I think you just described me, (laughs) honestly, (laughs) because I know that I am probably more introverted uh, and I get my um, restoration from being alone. And so I, you know, I see that about myself and it takes a lot of energy for me to do a lot of small talk, like at a party. So I know, and it's this complete opposite for my husband and he thrives on that, but I know, I kind of know what my limit is, right? Like I know how long I might want to stay there. I know that I can leave if I want to, I know who I want to um, invest more time in. And I'm okay with saying no to things that, you know, I don't have the the mental energy to, to take on at this point, but you're right. There is still a very much a sense of community. It's just that I also am totally fine being by myself. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, even me, Mr. Hyperactive, in a lot of ways, I resource by myself very effectively now. I really relish my time alone and in my own personal way of reading a book or, uh, you know, just listening to the breeze outside. And that's that has been a lot of practice mindfulness. OK, and that's a real core component of ADHD uh, and why I think in the ideas of community, respecting the mindfulness space that people need or what their boundaries are, being aware of them. All those things are critically important for us, uh, if, you know. Well, and I love that you say, you said this a few times, it's a safe environment. It's a safe community. And I think that in my coaching groups and my membership and, and where I see the community uh, with our ADHD community, it, it is a safe place. And I think that that's what gives them, um, well, for example, there was somebody that came in late to one of our GPS sessions and I said, and they started to apologize. I'm like, you do not need to apologize. There's no apologizing in GPS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. You're here. This is great. Mm -hmm. We're happy you're here. And he made a comment saying, wow, I wish everyone would say that. Right. And yeah. so I think it is just giving them that safe space that it's okay that other people get it. Like I don't have yeah. to apologize yeah. and yeah. they understand. Yeah. Right. And it's turning those tables as well, Nikki, and giving them acceptance in that space to also give it to themselves, you know, mm -hmm. so that he can walk into a situation and know that I'm okay. I'm a little bit late, but that's, I accept that responsibility. And I just, you know, I don't think we, we really ongoingly want to support people in that internal development because that's where all the dark spots lie. That's where all the fears are. And when we get away from it, and that's when the crazies happen, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that um, so I can't speak enough of there is external support and all that validation is necessary. The internal space, I still think on the ADHD spectrum, I am after that hunt as really one of the most critical factors uh, beyond all the functional daily strategy needs, understanding about what it is got to keep talking about the mental, mental and emotional stress that's involved in individuals and how they handle it when they're not with others. You know, yeah. uh, it's just, you know, I must, again, single person in Austin, Texas, I'll never have a big center. That's just never who I am. Uh, but I will, you know, uh, I've even envisioned a season three could happen folks. Complex. Believe I it when I it. see it, you big talker. I know. Talker. Good, good, yeah. good. Could be a couple of years, but it sure would be fun. It sure would be fun uh, because yeah. as those are community pieces. Well, they yeah. are community pieces, and I think that's really uh, that's a really important note, right? And and I I want to pivot back to to COVID uh, just a bit because it's something we hear all the time. Like there were just the, the way we changed through lockdown, right. It, that we, we started and we were, we were one sort of person and we came out, we were another sort of person. I'm curious if you have ever plumbed the depths of potential positive things that might have come out with just being challenged to explore this part of our identity that was sort of unlocked by the force yeah. of nature. Yes. Uh, so yes, as an exploratory quester, you know, of interesting neurological imaginary kind of spaces, those kind of things. I actually, yes, I took on COVID, uh, in that perspective, I did deep dives into myself based on resourcing and, uh, how is this helping me? What bandwidth? And I really believe I've got a lot of strength and resilience from that time because I was conscious. I had my eyes open. I knew what was going on and I kept having um, visions of being able to get through it. I started a book club at the beginning of COVID for support with other people. I did things actively to start that community process. That but, you would not be doing uh, otherwise. I don't think I would have ever done something like that. Uh, but the abject, so when we're, when we're hit with a survivalist need like that, right? Yeah. How do you, how does someone go toward thriving, something that's going to help benefit me here? And how does someone, when, when does someone just go into survival instinct and they feel like they're just barely hanging on? I really think it comes back to internal resource. How strong are you in yourself to be able to look at difficulty, darkness, strain, and stress with a positive outlook, with an outlook that says, 
I can find a way through this. This is where I changed the ideas of myself as an ADHD pathfinder to help people find pathways through their ADHD. Mm -hmm. Because there's a term I have, Pete, that I call functional pressure. Okay, Functional pressure is how do I consciously put pressure on myself in a way that's meaningful, getting things done, organization, follow through. Uh, but in this case, how do I put enough pressure? Because the body responds to pressure if it's not too much. Okay, We have pressure all the time, mm -hmm. expectations, obligations, relationship. So we want to have that kind of resilient knowledge. And this is where, okay, so I've done deep diving into breathing and cold water techniques and all these other pieces for resourcing my body. And I think it's because you can, uh, you can really gain strength from that. So with COVID, how do you, how, what do we get from it? I think we became stronger if you remain conscious throughout it and didn't feel like a victim the entire time and that you were being, uh, you know, just uh, lambasted from 10,000 different ways. Now, we all went through grief. Mm -hmm. I know people who died very close to me, no fun. Uh, and so that was the reality of the situation. It still is to some degree. Right. So I don't know that, I, but that's how you do it. But you really have to, uh, you know, you have to be resilient in that space. Well, and I think you just hit it that this this whole idea, and, and I want to connect it back to community. That sure that in in fact the community that comes out of something like the 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 stress of COVID is a different sort of community than you might be just maybe taking for granted in your day to day without that experience. And so, I I think it's sort of important that we take the time now that years have passed to reflect on who we did become as a result of COVID. I'm a different person than I was before that. I'm a different person than before, you know, dad died from it. Like, I'm a different person as a result of the grief and the people and the resources that I called upon to, to help me through that piece. I would not have done it the way that I did it were it not for the societal stresses that we were under. Right. And I weirdly, I don't think I've ever said it out loud, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, yeah. I, that is and, a, that's a yeah. big thing. Yes, and that's a turning point for you personally, yeah. but for many people to be able to say, okay, I get the depth that I've created as a result of it. And I'm glad, and not glad that it happened. I'm grateful that I've learned from it. Okay, would I have chosen it? No one's necessarily going to choose that kind right. of pain. But I, you can find gratitude. So appreciation and gratitude, right? One of the other elixirs of life. Yes. Um, and by the way, I tell my ADHD couples, if you're looking for, you know, the one key element in a relationship, particularly around ADHD, but in any relationship, is a, where's your appreciation gratitude meter? How mm -hmm. much are you appreciative and grateful for each other ongoing in a real overt way? Uh, as I've said, I've never had a couple uh, who's come in and said, okay, I've been appreciated too much. Too much gratitude here. Stop doing that. <laughs> I'm it's too a, grateful. They're too nice. Oh, too too nice. kind. Well, there's something. Too... <laughs> yeah. It's like, no. And when I hit that meter, then the, the, the couples don't come back because they're happy with each other. Right. Yeah. So yeah. appreciation and gratitude, as you're talking about, Pete, that's a really important threshold. But it allows... Uh, we do that with ADD, it's critically important to be able to look at what ADD is or isn't. And with community, it's critically important because it validates your experience. You witness yes. yourself and others and getting better. This is why your GPS sessions and all the coaching pieces and the I'm, I'm going to make a coffee with Pete at some point here. That's just <laughs> too much fun. <laughs> Don't drink coffee anymore, but... I will make it's a coffee. It's okay. We accept tea drinking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. I have great herbal teas. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but no, those are critically pieces. This is why I started the ADHD town hall last spring you were referring to. It's yeah. in its fourth season, get ready to start this month. And it's a blast. It's just the funnest thing I do because I want to help people connect to themselves and connect to others so that we normalize what's happening here. Validation. I'm getting, I'm stuck on that word. Just as soon as you said it, because it is so important, isn't it, to feel like your feelings are validated. And I think when you're in a group of people, when you're in a group of um, 
with a group of people who understand and get where you're coming from, that automatically validates it. And I think it also just makes you feel better that you're not the only one thinking this, yeah. 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 you know, and yeah. that it's not the, I'm not the only one that it's happening to. Right. Well, and we can circle back to safety there because you're seeing yourself mm-hmm. through and in others and in that self of seeing yourself through and in others and they're struggling or having the same feelings I have now where there's a community of camaraderie of connection. I'm not alone. And as soon as I'm not alone, here's the interrelated beingness that we're connected to others. We need to be connected to others. We know from orphan children that, you know, not having that physical touch or connection with others is horribly uh, disruptive to the development of the of the brain and socialization and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just an ongoing. This I'm so glad y'all brought on community, uh, you know, this month because um, I always do like the the oxymoron, right, of ADHD awareness month, where awareness is one of our greatest challenges. I'm like, okay, we could have called it a different, something yeah, different. Right. <laughs> ADHD celebration month, right? <laughs> right, right. I want to turn the tables just a little bit as we kind of lean toward the sunset of our conversation today. And and that is, it's easy for me to to continue to be considerate of what I'm getting out of my communities and what I'm asking for from my communities and my involvement in it. But I, that can over time feel like a selfish act. And if I am going to be a good member of a community, whether it's my, you know, my uh, D and D group or my church group or my whatever group it is, or my online group, um, part of, of what community is, is what I put back into it. How do you talk about being a good community member, particularly in a time of strife? The first thing I say there is a statement that says, when we give to others, it's a universal fact that we always get back more than we have given. Mm Mm-hmm either through appreciation, gratitude, connection, kindness, all these spaces. So the idea that I'm in a community and I feel like I have to constantly ask for my needs to be met, but not to give to others, it's an unbalanced equation and you'll feel it. The individual feels it. And so I I love community where there is camaraderie built into it meaning we are all doing things together. We're helping each other out. Everyone is looking at their resources or how they can be a part of. Uh, And so someone who comes in in that space that they have overt needs or their needs are greater than what they can give yet, that's a process of filling up a cup to where then they're looking at their talents. How do they give back to that community? But I just think it's a, it's a, a, it's a two-way street all the time. And those who feel like they're constantly just taking from a community, missing half the equation because they don't realize what they're, what they would get back by giving to others. Uh, And I think that, like I said, if you have systems built within communities so that camaraderie or the give back is a part of the community, it changes the perspective because everyone understands what, you know, the expectations or the rules or the agreements are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that that helps a lot. I I was browsing, doing some research for another episode, and I ran into this quote, speaking of the, you know, the trope, the glasses, you know, half full, full, it's always full of something. Uh, And uh, this is (laughs) Philippe Cross, who says, "In, in my case, my view is, of course, there is only one possibility. The glass is actually always full. It is part full of air the other part with liquid, but it is always full. And that just warmed my heart this morning. When you think about the balance of, of what you give and what you have to offer uh, your sort of community, your support group, uh, you know, when when contrasted with what you are taking from it as a result to keep yourself healthy and strong and and connected. And this is also where when you think about just being in a community and being present and sharing your story courageously is a part of giving to others. That's one of the things we have to realize that that vulnerability is important because that's how others open up and feel validated and feel connected with. 
And so yeah. authenticity is a big part of community uh, and really allowing people to be the unique individual selves that they can be. Um, and I, you know, it's one of the things I really feel healthy about is having gotten to that space that I really am. I'm just who I am in my community. When I go to talks and do speeches or trainings, you're seeing who is this who I am now. And that's who I am on a, you know, watching a baseball game. It's like, yeah, it's, but how long, how long did it take you to get there? Uh, too many years. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of the answer I was, yeah, I was vibing. I mean, it's, <laughs> me too, it, man. Me too. <laughs> it does. And it's an evolution, right? It's a, it's a honing, but I do think that it can happen sooner for individuals with the validation process and what we know around ADHD. Uh, it happens sooner because of, to me, what we know about it. You know, I look at my son, I look at, uh, now he's a mentee, someone named Colin and, California that I talk with. And both of those were raised in very supportive ADHD environments. Not that they don't have storms and challenges, sure, but they just like who they are and, you know, they feel good about who they are. They're able to give back. And so I think it starts from the bottom. You know, I have, a, um, I did a parenting talk for a, um, a great dyslexia school up in Seattle Ross and Saunders, not Ross and Saunders, that's in Austin, Hamlin Robinson up in Seattle, that is still getting a lot of airplay on ADHD and parenting. And that's something you could put in the show notes if you want to, that's mm -hmm. a really good way for parents to think about ADHD and how to help kids be supportive in understanding who and what they are. So this is great. It is great. Let's talk Thank then you. about your, I mean, here we are talking about community and, you know, we already teased it. There you go, <laughs> creating your own community. Uh, uh, tell us what your, uh, what's next with the ADHD Town Hall group. It's, uh, so we kick off this Thursday for our six week uh, webinar, interactive virtual webinar. Um, you know, I'll open the topic up each week. And the interesting part is, yes, I am keeping the same six topics every year because it's those six areas, whether it's uh, chasing your shinies is how I've named it this year or understanding your emotional patterns. We talk about the things that are most difficult within the ADHD space, but it's an interactive community. So now I've invited in therapists uh, to come in, watch, and be a part of the community. We have spouses, we have coworkers, we have people diagnosed, because that's what a true town hall is. Help me understand what's happening here. Uh, and I am, I can't describe the excitement I have. It's been my fourth season now, and I can just see this being like, I feel like some Seinfeld episode uh, that's happening. <laughs> You know, it's like I can't predict it. And so I'm excited about what's going to happen next. But it starts this Thursday. It's six weeks. Uh, and, you know, do recordings of it so you can watch them again for the next six months until the next town hall starts. But I'm building a community. I want folks to come back and have fun in it twice a year. And the last thing I'll say about that is I see it as what I call touchstone coaching, which is come and touch about your ADHD twice a year, kind of run yourself through the ringer. Uh, where are you? Ask questions and keep living life in a really healthy way. Well, you know, it's probably great that you do the same six topics, too, because they need that yeah, reinforcement, you know, exactly. twice, twice a year to check in with yourself. Yep. If you were to do all different topics all the time, I think it'd be really overwhelming. So good job, <laughs> yeah, James, Ochoa. Yeah, yeah, James Ochoa. It feels fun. And we'll see where we are yeah. in season 40. Uh, Love which it. Will be someday. <laughs> you know, I'll be 85 and I'll still be. You know. All right. Yeah. Well, and, uh, right. I, I already teased it. So give me the update on the book. When do I get the book? <laughs> so uh, you get the first, you get the uh, exclusive on these pieces. So we're writing the book <laughs> this summer. Okay. We're writing, tw we're writing twice a week, four hours at a time. I'm going out to my writing coaching editor's house, Robin. Uh, and we are just getting lost in writing about ADHD storms. You have no idea what it's like to write about these things. And so here's a telling fact. This is where you'll get little teasers going forward. I would get physically nauseous when I was reading through all this we were writing about because uh, it's just like, ah, I can see it. Yeah. And so we've come up with, we've finally got them pared down into a group that we think is going to be manageable. We're writing actively about the storms, but uh, there's going to be resourcing in the book, but there's also going to be the ideas of, 
what does shiny mean? Shiny is positive, shiny is negative, shiny is a process with which we chase after things and we normalize it. Um, and updates on mindfulness, updates on my perspective on ADD. But it's, um, it's proving to be as intriguing to write as the first book was. Um, I was scoping as early as next fall. I think it could be a year from there. Um, uh, I hope not longer, you know, but uh, it's just, it's going to take as long as it takes. I will be happy to come on here and give y'all updates as we go. I'll give you a little tidbit. Absolutely. Uh, we shall begin the breath holding. But it now. is in, it's in process. Key. It really is. Okay. And it's the last thing I'll say is it's actually turned out to be, I didn't think I had a second book in me because I wasn't sure there was a need after opening up the uh, chasm on mental and emotional stress, as it turns out, talking about the storms and how they affect career and relationships and the long-term nature of working within them, it's going to be as, if not more important than just opening up the space of how the emotional and mental stress happens. So it's like one of those strange spaces. And again, I'm like, okay, we will get through this. It'll happen. Uh, and I will continue to give y'all exclusive updates on that i love being able to come here and talk about it so thank you for asking oh, great well we appreciate we you look so forward much to it. james for yeah. sure absolutely for sure for sure so much fun where do you want to send people james ochoa.com it's the easiest place to get to I've done a little repurposing of the website so it's easy to navigate uh actually okay. had my son jules you know jules we do did a little ux research on my website for me so it makes it a Big little fan. easier for people to get around outstanding uh, james ochoa.com Link in the show notes to all the goodies we've talked about today. Uh, as always, James, you're fantastic. So much thanks fun. For, thanks yeah. for being here, buddy. Thank you. Uh, and of course, we appreciate all of you hanging out, watching this show in the live stream. If you are a Patreon member uh, and those of you listening to the show, wherever you find your podcast, we appreciate you too. Thanks for downloading and listening. And thank you for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to this conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel and our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming one of those patrons at a deluxe level or better. Patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer and James Ochoa, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm -hmm.